So, so uh, the focus is on acute pancreatitis, and, and clearly I'm a surgeon, so this will, is going to be a very sort of surgically orientated talk. Um, so that's good for you guys to know as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh, as pancreatitis is sort of a multidisciplinary disease, but the um, surgeons obviously have an important role. So just to go back to a bit of uh, embryology, so the pancreas gets formed sort of in the fifth week of uh, 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 gestation, and uh, it is a ventral and a dorsal butt basically, and then sort of the, when the um, rotation of the gut happens, it's a four gut organ. So when the, the rotation of the gut gut happens, it sort of merges uh, um, the, the, the 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 ventral and the dorsal butt, and both of these uh, pancreas. Are, Pancreases have a sort of a small duct, and these ducts merge, sort of in the eighth week of uh, of pregnancy, and then um, uh, form the pancreas. And you can see here in this right uh, lower image, this is how a normal pancreas would look. So where the uh, uh, the ventral butt is, this part here, which is sort of the uh, uncinate process and part of the head, and the dorsal butt is basically the rest of the head of the pancreas and the rest of the body of the pancreas, and these these ducts need to merge and, and then drain into the papilla of fat or the major papilla uh, uh, in order to have a normal pancreas. And in some people, this merge, and it's about 4 to 4 to 14% in literature, but that is basically based on MRCP studies, so it might be much higher. Uh, but if it doesn't merge, then there's a minor papilla in which the main duct uh, drains. There are some theories that when people have a pancreas divism, that it could be a cause of pancreatitis as well, but it's not completely understood. Quickly, the anatomy. So the pancreas can be sort of divided in several uh, uh, components. So you've got the internet process here. This green bit is the head of the pancreas. This we call the neck of the pancreas and the body and the tail, sort of the main vessels that are lie around it. And it's sort of relevant in pancreatitis, but we'll get there later. So you've got the uh, celiac trunk here with the splenic artery going to the spleen and the common hepatic duct, which then uh, gives off the gastroduodenal artery and then the proper hepatic duct, uh, sorry, proper hepatic artery, I'm sorry. This is the uh, superior mesenteric artery and the portal vein. Uh, there's uh, the superior mesenteric vein going into the purple portal vein, basically, but it's obviously continuing with each other. And again, sort of an overview where you can see that the, uh, the bile duct and the uh, pancreatic duct sort of merge in the end uh, and both sort of drain in the, uh, in the um, uh, papilla of fat. And obviously this is important because one of the causes of pancreatitis is gallstone disease and that's basically because gallstones drop into the common duct and 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 irritate the pancreas down below where the uh, uh well if and down below in the distal common bile duct so physiology wise well again brief it's endocrine function and exocrine function so uh, the insulin gets formed in uh, the langerhans uh, uh islands and and uh, uh have obviously their uh, their use in the endocrine function and exocrine function is where digestive enzymes are formed um, uh, aiding digestion so basically pancreatitis is an acute inflammation of the pancreas and its surrounding retroperitoneal tissue um, it's an incidence of well, anywhere between 10 to 40 per hundred thousand uh, uh, people the pathophysiology is it's not 100 percent completely understood but there is sort of an idea a thought that you know the trypsinogen and trypsinogen activated protein causes uh, activation of the uh, the uh, intra uh, pancreatic enzymes which should be inactive and once they get active within the pancreas um, sort of this cascade uh, 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 gets activated which leads to cell damage pancreatic cell damage and inflammation and then obviously to pancreatitis so causes of pancreatitis, I think uh, the main causes obviously are, uh, are gallstones uh, up to 60% uh, and alcohol is a good second. And this obviously uh, depends a bit. There are some uh, uh, countries where the alcoholic percentage is a bit higher than other countries, but these are the main main things. And then the list of there is um, uh, ERCP is uh, people can develop uh, a pancreatitis after ERCP and then there's drugs induced and, and then infectious causes, so tumor or cyst can cause pancreatitis, the autoimmune, uh, uh, there's an autoimmune uh, disease that's called pancreatitis and IgG4 autoimmune uh, related pancreatitis is quite a, a, a common one when it comes to autoimmune pancreatitis. Trauma can cause pancreatitis and there's unknown causes as well in 10%. However, the recent study has shown that 
if you do a uh, endoscopic ultrasound in patients with uh, unknown cause of pancreatitis in in, in um, who can run I think it's 20 to 30 percent of these unknown pancreatitics they find microlithiasis or small stones within either the gallbladder or the bile duct causing the pancreatitis I get smashed I mean maybe some people have known uh, have heard of that that's a way to sort of uh, 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 remember pancreatitis one of the funny ones in there is a scorpion sting which you obviously don't see a lot of in uh, in in wet northwestern Europe but um, this is a way to sort of for people to remember uh, the causes of pancreatitis symptoms um, I think the main symptom obviously is abdominal pain back pain is important uh, so the pancreatitis is a retroperitoneal organ uh, so pain often radiates to the to the back people often come with nausea and vomiting uh, you could have some abdominal distension even an ileus but it's not not, not that common in the early phases uh, patients come with a, a fever and it's rather uh, due to sort of the SERS reaction rather than due to infectious causes because early pancreatitis especially is not an infectious disease it's an inflammatory disease so it's not caused by bacteria but it's caused by the inflammation of the pancreatic uh, tissue due to the due to the enzymes tachycardia obviously when patients are uh, in pain and have fever so more moderate and severe pancreatitis all the symptoms of mild pancreatitis can 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 uh, occur but the people with severe pancreatitis could be hemodynamically unstable they can have more organ failure it could be jaundice so these are things you would see on in patients that present themselves with these symptoms uh, with pancreatitis um, you may have heard of the great turner and the cullen signs i mean I've, I've mentioned these because they are so you know often mentioned in in in, in um uh when it comes to pancreatitis they're obviously uh, the Cullen sign is sort of a, a, a hematoma around the um, around the um, uh, uh, the belly button, and the Great Turner sign is sign is is sort of this 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 discoloration or hematoma in the flank. It is often associated with with very severe necrot necrotizing pancreatitis, or sometimes with bleeding. It's a these are late signs of severe necrotizing pancreatitis, and it's obviously not something one would see in a patient that comes with early on, uh, early onset pancreatitis in ED. But I'll just mention it because a lot of textbooks talk about this. But basically, when patients come to the emergency room, I think the diagnosis is mainly made on these sort of three uh, three things. It's the typical sort of epigastric pain, which is sort of a constant pain, which radiates, which might, might radiate to the uh, to the back. The lipase or amylase is three times the upper limit of normal. And the CT findings of pancreatitis would show a swollen pancreas with some fat stranding and maybe some fluid around the pancreas. Having said that, the CT has not uh, hasn't really got a real place in the uh, initial diagnosis of pancreatitis. And if a patient comes into ED with very typical symptoms of pancreatitis and the lipase or amylase is three times the upper limit of normal, you can basically uh, uh, diagnose the patient with pancreatitis. And CT is often sort of reserved or should be reserved for for uh, if the diagnosis is not completely clear. Having said that, most patients uh, these days in an emergency department with abdominal pain uh, don't get anywhere without having a CT, which, well, you could debate on very long as well. <clears throat> so the elevated enzymes, um, so these enzymes we're talking about are lipase and amylase, they have quite a high sensitivity in the first 24 hours after onset of symptoms. We have to realize that they will decline sort of in this sort of in the week after uh, the after the first symptoms uh, um, uh, occur. So sometimes people come to the emergency room a bit later, and um, there might be already a decline in the enzymes. So you need to realize that. Um, and the level of enzymes doesn't really correlate with the severity of the disease. So you can have very high enzymes but still have a mild uh, mild pancreatitis. Um, and then. There's this, always been this debate about is it better lipase or amylase. Um, they say that lipase has a, a larger diagnostic window, so it's, it's, it's positive a bit longer. Um, and it's in some prospective studies, it's shown to have a higher sensitivity and, speci sensitivity and specificity. So you could argue that lipase is the best test to do uh, uh, for pancreatitis because it's a bit more uh, uh, sensitive. Very important to realize, and this is a nice. Uh, screenshot I took from the Kid Show's uh, uh, um, uh, Twitter account. So a nice account to follow, actually, because he puts a lot of these little images on, on Twitter about all kinds of things in GI surgery and GI uh, uh, or gastrointestinal uh, uh, 
problems really, not only surgical, but also medical problems. So there's many different causes of, uh, of a rise in MLAs or lipase. And so one of my uh, main pet peeves was when I was a surgical registrar and still now as a HB surgeon is that often in ED, a patient gets, uh, comes in with abdominal, some fake abdominal pain and then the MLAs is high and then people stop looking uh, uh, and they say, okay, this patient needs to go to the surgeon or the HB surgeon as he's got um, uh, pancreatitis. But it's very important, I think, to realize when you're working in an emergency room or wherever you you work and see patients with 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 abdominal pain and and and, and elevated enzymes that it there are there are other causes and it's not always pancreatitis and i think you know good history good physical examination um all these things are very important so as i said earlier a lot of these patients automatically go to ct scan but that uh, or, or just get one blood test and they look at this one blood test and that that makes a diagnosis it's it's, it's a bit more nuanced than that so i think going forward in your careers i think it's very important to realize that 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 uh, um it is not always that straightforward <clears throat> so you can see so the differential surgical differential diagnosis i think uh, is in the, in the top part uh, for 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 uh, pancreatitis you can have an upper gastrointestinal ulcer perforation, especially perforation, will give you a high MLAs as well. Mesenteric infarction, retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which could then sort of give a little bit of uh, irritation of the pancreas, could give you uh, elevated enzymes. Cholecystitis or cholangitis, a rupture triple A, abdominal aneurysm, but even a myocardial infarction or pneumonia could sometimes uh, elevate your uh, uh, enzyme and give you some so, some upper abdominal pains as well. So. It, it's important not to to blindly stare at one blood result, but do a, a formal uh, formal assessment of the patient. So, the severity of pancreatitis is obviously very important. Um, luckily, most of the patients with pancreatitis will uh, will have a mild pancreatitis. About eighty percent of the patients uh, uh, will uh, uh, will have mild uh, pancreatitis, and these patients will rarely uh, uh, become very unwell or, or become uh, or die of this disease. However, 20% uh, to 25% of them will develop a more severe pancreatitis with, uh, with multi-organ failure, uh, need for intensive care uh, uh, support and, and, and uh, more extensive <coughs> interventions and, um, and there's a higher chance of dying. So how do we predict severity? I think um, um, when patients are you and well, clearly, I think, you know, as you a few slides back when they're coming with hemodynamic instability and all these kind of things, that is obviously a sign that they're not doing great. If they're already in multi-organ failure when they're in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ED, that's obviously a very bad sign. So first, an early sign of, of, of multi-organ failure could be a decreased urinary output. So that's something we want to look for. Um, high CRP, <clears throat> so anywhere anywhere above 130, 150 patients having a high CRP on initial uh, uh, presentation have a higher chance of developing a more severe uh, pancreatitis. The several scores, which I will not go into, but the Apache 2 score, the Renton score, and the Glasgow Imri score, these are sort of based on, on, on several things. They're based on uh, lab results, uh, hemodynamic uh, results, so uh, vital signs, age, all these kind of things go in sort of these different scores and you add up points and when you get above a certain uh, certain term, uh, grade, then you are at a chance of, of, of having, a, uh, you have a higher chance of developing a, a more severe pancreatitis. However, the positive predictive value of these tests is still only 50%. The negative predictive value is quite high. So if this, if you've got a low score, then you're likely to have a mild pancreatitis. But if you have a very high score, it can still be a mild pancreatitis. But it, it gives you a little bit of a guidance when you see a patient in in, in ED and and then go through one of these scores and add up these things. You can you can sort of predict if he's is going one way or another way. But it, you know, just keep re, you need to keep reassessing these patients, especially in the first four, first twenty four to forty eight hours. Um, um, of their um, presentation. So we talked about uh, <clears throat> we talked about imaging a little bit. Uh, CT. So in the initial sort of first assessment, when people come to ED, it's, it's physical examination and blood results are the most important uh, parameters for you to decide what uh, what the patient has. Um, 
you do want to know the etiology of the pancreatitis. So in that case, an ultrasound scan would be sort of always in the, uh, uh, so within the first sort of day or two, you would always do an ultrasound scan to make sure that you um, get the etiology right. So uh, to, find, to find stones basically. Um, so the CT would be indicated if you don't really, if you're still in doubt of the diagnosis and then you could find the early signs of pancreatitis on the CT scan. Um, uh, but it has, the CT scan has a very important role, and we'll get there a little bit later in the presentation, where the, the CT scan has got a quite an important role in sort of the monitoring of the progress of pancreatitis and sort of the decision-making of when are you going to intervene uh, in pancreatitis. An endoscopic ultrasound is a, is a, is a tool we use. Um, um, this, well, I said earlier, you could use this for patients who have got a, a, an unknown etiology of pancreatitis to, to, to see if they maybe still have stones. But he, uh, it's also used for uh, for interventional uh, 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 um, purposes in in pancreatitis. We'll get there in a bit later as well. An MRCP obviously can show you stones. An MRCP could potentially show you if someone has a pancreatic division. And um, uh, an ERCP will uh, uh, clearly also has a role in in. Um, uh, intervention uh, you could it also has a little bit of a diagnostic function but i think you have to be careful with ercps because it's obviously in, in a, in an invasive uh, uh, imaging method these are things that we would use in, in in pancreatitis so in the initial management um very important is uh, fluid resuscitation um sort of the old gold standard was um, that uh, people needed a high of three to four liters in the first 24 hours. There's a bit more nuance to that. Um, normally, we now would go for a more moderate uh, rate of infusion with uh, a ringed lactate or a Hartman solution, as it's sometimes called. Uh, pain control is important, obviously. Um, oral pain medication if people can eat and drink, but uh, often people struggle with that. And then a, a PCA, patient-controlled analgesia, might be a, a good way forward. Uh, normal enteral feeding is uh, superior to being nil by mouth or having TPN. Uh, but NJ feeding can be considered if normal eating is, is problematic. And there's no uh, there's no place for prophylactic antibiotics in acute uh, in early acute pancreatitis. Again, it's not a disease that's caused by um, a bacterial infection. It's caused by inflammation due to chemical, uh, due to chemical uh, inflammation due to the pancreatic enzymes that get activated within the pancreas. Um, flu resuscitation, what does it do? Well, it, it prevents pancreatic necrosis. Um, one of the theories is that uh, due to the uh, third fluid space loss, uh, there is vasoconstriction of the pancreas and um, uh, uh, with the vasoconstriction, there's a hyperperfusion of the pancreatic tissue and that then causes necrotic, uh, necrosis of the pancreas. So if you keep people well perfused, you might prevent pancreatic necrosis. It reduces your sort of in, initial uh, inflammatory response, it might prevent multi-organ failure down, uh, down the line. Um, and again, as I said, uh, it preserves pancreatic microcirculation. Um, the best sort of guide if somebody's well perfused is you uh, is is, is uh, uh, um, if they're uh, having any urine production. So if patients patients are unwell in this state, it might be sensible giving them a, a, a urinary catheter just to keep a, a close eye on on the urine production. So as I said, which fluid? So recently we published a, a meta-analysis of, of randomized clinical trials and that's sort of, uh, it, it's all quite low level evidence, but, but again, um, uh, moderate rate fluid resuscitation seems to be the way forward and the ring is lactase or Hartman is the, is the best, um, is the best uh, uh, fluid to give. Uh, on the feeding of pancreatitis, um, in the old days, again, um, they thought patients needed pancreatic arrest. Um, they should not have their pancreas uh, irritated more by having food and passing and and, 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 and and stimulating the pancreatic enzymes even more. But this is uh, this is all uh, proven to be nonsense. There was a um, Cochrane uh, a review where they looked at um, where they compared several studies that looked at enteral versus parenteral feeding 
and people having enteral feeding where uh, had reduced mortality, reduced morbidity, and less need for interventions. And then a, a study um, done in 2014, randomized controlled trial, showed that um, uh, there's no benefit of giving people NJ feeding. Uh, so you could just give them oral feeding and then keep the NJ feeding. So nasal jejunal tube, which is basically a tube, go through the nose, past the pancreas and sits for, uh, past the trites ligament or the DJ flexor into the jejunum and feed uh, people, uh, people that way. Um, there's no real benefit of that uh, over uh, just letting people eat, except when people really, really struggle with nausea or all kinds of reasons, then one could just, one could um, uh, consider giving them an, an nasal jejunal feeding tube. Uh, and the whole uh, oral feeding uh, has recently been uh, uh, studied again in a, in a randomized controlled trial published at the beginning of this month in um, or last month in uh, the annals of surgery. And again, they showed that people had um, early enteral feeding, had a shorter length of stay, and there was a, a reduction of, of overall costs of, uh, of, of treating the patients. Um, early interventions in gallstone pancreatitis. Again, for gallstone pancreatitis, the biggest cause of pancreatitis. So um, we know that taking away the cause of the uh, of the pancreatitis will help. So uh, if you do a cholecystectomy, basically that that will prevent uh, um, that will prevent um, episodes in future. And this uh, trial, the Poncho trial, published in 2016 in British Journal of Surgery, showed actually that sort of an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy is indicated in patients with a mild pancreatitis. Uh, mild colson pancreatitis, and in that study, they compared doing it within three days of uh, of, of, of of presentation, compared it to, and I think it was mm, th 20, 21 weeks or something around something or other. But basically, they they um, they advised doing the uh, laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy within the index admission in patients that have a mild pancreatitis. Um, doing an ERCP. For gallstone pancreatitis is basically not indicated, even not in patients with predicted severe pancreatitis. If they have proven common bile duct stones but are not cholangitic, then you don't need to do a, a then there's no benefit in doing a ERCP in that stage, so it's better not to. These are two studies included uh, done by the Dutch pancreatitis work group. It's quite interesting. I mean, the only downside of this side it's in Dutch, but if some of the words will probably be recognizable and you could uh, go and find all their trials because it's They've done some really great stuff in um, in um, in pancreatitis, and a lot of the sort of things we do now in pancreatitis are um, thanks to uh, the very good randomized control trials uh, led by this uh, uh, pancreatitis work group um, led by uh, Mark Besseling. Um, so complications of pancreatitis. Um, well, systemic systemic complications are sepsis, uh, SERS. Uh, looking at chest infections and I mean, they've got pain in the upper abdomen so they won't breathe properly uh, with that they get pneumonias and these kind of things multi-organ failure um, due to Sophia's uh, SERS response pancreatic necrosis people can develop pancreatic pseudocysts they can develop pseudoaneurysms and that's mainly from arteries that sort of lie around the uh, 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 around the uh, the pancreas that's obviously uh, the splenic artery is quite at risk for this or the gastroduodenal artery Obviously, pancreas insufficiency when the pancreas tissue gets necrotic, it doesn't, it, it won't, you know, once it's, once it's, once it's uh, necrotic, it won't ever become uh, uh, um, vital again. So it's basically lost tissue. If you lose enough tissue, you obviously uh, develop endocrine and exocrine insufficiency. Um, when you develop necrosis uh, around the duct, you can get the pancreatic duct disruption. This often uh, causes a leak of pancreatic fluid outside of the pancreas, which then also creates more problems you can have a higher you have a higher risk of, of, of pseudoaneurysms and 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 and, away, and you can get develop pseudocysts due to this um a way of treating this could be with a pancreatic stand placed via ERCP and portal vein thrombosis is another complication so <clears throat> fluid around the pancreas um it's very important to understand um when fluid comes um, fluid that you need to intervene on. So this is an early scan you see and the two arrows sort of point at, so, the, so this is clearly pancreatic tissue and this pancreas enhances normally. 
Um, so this is a scan with contrast. You can see there is contrast in the aorta. And you can see the kidneys are enhancing. You can see the liver is enhancing. You can nicely see the pancreas enhancing. The pancreas looks relatively okay to me in all fairness. But you can see there is this, this sort of, the fat needs to be black like here, but you can see this is like it's what we call fat stranding around the pancreas, which is fluid that sits around the pancreas. So every, well, clearly when you share, if you have an, any infection in the body, fluid will go there. So the same with the pancreas. So this is sort of a non-organized fluid collection around the pancreas in, early, in the early phase. This can basically disappear and the pancreatitis remains uh, uh, mild and there's nothing you need to, uh, need to do about, there's nothing you need to do about this. So the pancreatic necrosis, that's another uh, thing that obviously can happen. And we discussed, I, I mentioned earlier, this might be related to third plate fluid loss and hyperperfusion and, 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 and decreased blood flow to pancreas. Different studies show different things, but up to five, between five to 20% of patients with uh, uh, pancreatitis develop pancreatic necrosis and the mortality can be quite high up to 40%. And there's some studies that say it's even higher, more in the range of 50%. The problems in necrotic tissues, they can get secondary infection due to translocation of bacteria. And when people get infected in necrosis, that, is, that carries an even higher mortality. So I think the patients with a high mortality of pancreatic necrosis are people who develop uh, infected uh, pancreatic necrosis. So this is an image of patients with a patient with a uh, uh, with a lot of pancreatic necrosis. You can see again, it's a contrast enhanced scan. It's always good to quickly see if it's contrast enhanced, you can just see the aorta. And answer so it's a contrast enhanced scan you can see the kidney and the spleen they're enhancing normally a bit of the liver here which enhances it's probably some stomach a little bit of fluid around it so there's just a bit of a fluid stranding here which it sort of sits around the stomach another thing you can see here is that if you compare it to the earlier scan i showed so the mesentery and the fat it all looks a bit more and angry the, the the arteries are a bit more pronounced it all means there's there's things going on in this guy in this patient's it, patient's belly and this is sort of the outer red thing is the outline of the pancreas where this where the little uh, asterisk is there is still some um, maybe some um, um, enhancing pancreas there might still be some enhancing pancreas here but there's clearly non-enhancing tissue here which is necrotic pancreas <clears throat> so another picture of that um, with some uh, 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 so you can again see so where the asterisk is this is a bit this is a bit of non-enhancing pancreas where the tail and the head um, do enhance. This is basically you could potentially develop a pancreatic duct uh, disruption. So the pancreas, the pancreatic duct run through this sort of necrotic bit of pancreas. You can, uh, you can understand that these patients would have leakage of fluid from the pancreas. And again, you can see this is a relatively early uh, a pancreatitis scan as there's some flat, fat stranding, but there's no real collection yet. There's a little bit of fat stranding there. And again, you know, you can see there's enhancement, so it's an enhanced scan. There is contrast in the aorta and the other organs enhance like they would. There's a little bit of contrast in the gut here as well. This patient probably had some oral contrast. Um, and here's just some diagrams. So this is what we call pancreatic necrosis. So you've got the pancreas, which is got a necrotic patch there. This is a peripancreatic necrosis, but often it's like this where there is pancreatic necrosis combined with peripancreatic necrosis. <clears throat> so the next thing is, um, it's what we call wall of necrosis. So in this uh, patient, again, I'm just going to go over the things. Just uh, again, it's a contrast enhanced scan. You can see some contrast in the aorta and the kidney and the liver are enhancing. You can see there's a little bit of enhancement here. So you can see this is sort of, there's not much pancreas left in this patient. There's a big sort of collection here. If you look carefully, you can see there's this sort of very um, thin rim of enhancement around, around the, the, the collections. And that's, that's what we call the wall of the pancreas. And that, that's uh, an enhanced pancreas. So there's, there's blood flow through that wall, but the tissue in there is obviously not necrotic. It's, it's obviously necrotic. Um, these darker patches, um, you could argue, is that air in the collection or is that just some fat? I think in this case, it's just a little bit of fat. A very good way, if you are looking at a CT scan to do is, is just to change the contrast settings a bit. Um, because the um, uh, if it's air, it will remain black. But if it's fat, it will go grayish or something like that. So that's a good way of looking at uh, if it, it looks if there's air in a scan. You could also do that if you suspect a number of a, of a perforation. Just play with the contrast and everything that remains black is air. So you can see free and in the, in the abdomen. 
uh, um, is a good way of looking for it. But I think this is just a, so this is a wall of necrosis, a necrotic collection in the pancreas and no air. And that's important um, because the next step would be infected necrosis. And in, that, in these two images, you can clearly see that. So again, uh, contrast enhanced scan. There's, you know, the the organs they are they enhance. There's a little bit of, this is probably a little bit of the aorta there, and um, so you can know there's there is contrast in the scan, and you can see these really dark patches, just like what sits here in the stomach, which is clearly air. This is fluid in the stomach. So this is air within the collection, and it's nobody's. If there was no intervention in this patient, then there's no other way. Uh, of air to get there other than translocation of bacteria and bacteria start to grow and form air and the same goes here there's this large collection of uh, this, this, this 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 large sort of pocket of air and this is a patient who's probably quite unwell and this is often a, a, a reason for us to intervene Yeah, it's sort of a wall. So somebody else is a fibrous tissue. It, I mean, it's a little, so there will be a little bit of fibrous tissue there as well, but it, it is, it, it's an enhancing wall. So there must be blood vessels in there as well. Otherwise it wouldn't enhance. So it, it's basically the body starts to sort of uh, shield the rest of the body off of the, of the infection, which, which, what's, what it will do. And it will just, uh, tissue will just sit around it. And that tissue is enhanced tissue. So there's vital tissue there. You could argue that fibrosis obviously wouldn't have that much blood in there. So the, infect, so the management of infective necrosis. So again, I'm going to talk about the old days, but it's again 20, 20, 25 years ago is where they would, uh, to test if somebody would have infected necrosis is they would uh, aspirate a bit of, uh, of the necrosis, but it's a very good way to infect it. So if, so the best way now to see if it's infected is, is to look for the air. And if there's no air in it, you should stay away unless patients are really, really unwell and there's no way they're getting back to an ICU. But did this, you need to be very patient with patients with uh, pancreatitis because they will be very unwell even if the necrosis is not infected. But you have to be careful that you don't infect it because we know that people who develop infected necrosis have a much higher chance of doing poorly than patients who just have a wall of necrotic collection. So um, as surgeons and HIV surgeons, you know, we get a lot, a lot of sort of questions from ITU or from, from other hospitals that refer patients to us, oh, do we have to drain already? Do we have to do something? So it's very, very important to, to make sure that you don't drain too early. Um, um, and again, in the old days, what one would do when there would be an infected necrosis and the patient would be very well, one would do an open necrosectomy, so just a laparotomy, scoop out all the necrosis, but these patients did awfully, they did awful, they had a very high mortality rate. So in 2010, um, the PANTA trial uh, that was run um, and um, they sort of um, suggested one has to do a step-up approach. And a step-up approach means um, wait, then drain before you do a necrosectomy. And I'll get go to a bit more detail later. But basically, that the PANTA trials basically changed the management of pancreatic necrosis completely. Open necrosectomy, especially in the Western world, is hardly done anymore. I mean, it's all done via the step-up approach. Uh, I think if you ever come into a hospital where they're not doing that, but they have the opportunity, then you should say something about it because uh, it really, really changed management. And then a few years later, that same study group um, had um, uh, uh, compared percutaneous necrosectomy versus endoscopic necrosectomy. And I'll go into more, more detail in a bit. Um, and that showed that uh, there's no real difference in um, outcome for patients. However, patients with complete endoscopic treatment will have less um, fistulas, uh, which is basically when you put a drain in somebody, they will develop a fistula. Uh, whereas if you have a endoscopic uh, approach, and I'll come to some slides about that later, you also have a fistula, but it's an internal fistula and it bothers the patient less. Again, it's, it's a very important to wait. So um, uh, patients get admitted, uh, do whatever you need to do to keep the patient alive. If the patient needs to go to ITU, patient goes to ITU, organ support, all these kind of things, uh, fluid resuscitation, um, do frequent imaging if the patient gets more and well, but hold off intervention as long as possible. Um, often not until the four, fourth or fifth week after they first had symptoms, um, the, will the time be there uh, for the first intervention? Because it takes that long for wall of necrosis to form and you can't drain, you can't drain that sort of, peripancreatic fluid without a wall, that's not something one can drain. You can only drain something that has, has 
a proper capsule around it. So you have to wait, so you have to have that patience. And again, you have to be careful not to infect a sterile necrotic collection. So if you put a drain into a sterile necrotic collection, you would have you will obviously uh, 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 infect it at that time and patients will do uh, poorly. So again, the necrosectomy is a, a way to get rid of necrosis. Open necrosectomy has been, uh, whether again in the Western world, mostly abandoned after uh, the, the New England Journal of Medicine trial. Endoscopic is a way in, per, percutaneous is a way in. Um, and um, I'll go through these things in later slides. Um, and um, so percutaneous approach, so, for, for the, so e, e, the, both the endoscopic and the percutaneous approach, um, some, if you just put a drain in, that will be sufficient in about 35 to 40% of the patients, they will never need necrosectomy. Um, but if they uh, if they don't get better, then obviously you have to upsize the drain and, and then go for for more uh, a more aggressive approach. Um, oh, I didn't know what that one is. Okay, okay, this is just basically showing. Uh, um, well, mortality. How uh, if you get infected necrosis, your mortality rate is high. Um, and this is a slide. I'm just going to skip through this one. Um, so this is a, a diagram of the uh, of infected necrosis. Again, you can see uh, that the brown bit is if it's a necro necrotic collection. This is the pancreas. Uh, um, this is a drain going into. This is an interventional radiological place drain going into the collection, um, and um, this is how it would look on a CT scan. So you can see the. Uh, 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 the drain going in. It's important you get a window. Often you get a window between uh, the, the 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 colon and the spleen on the kidneys. There's a small window in, um, but that is. But if the, if you would do the endoscopic approach for this patient, you can see the stomach is right on the collection. You could so your your route in could be via an endoscopic route and put a drain in in in, in like this. Uh, if you then, if the patient gets more unwell, you could, for instance, upsize the drain because the first drain patients get put in are often small, but you can upsize it to a 12 French drain, for instance. And this is all how it sort of looks to the patient. It's, uh, it sits in the flank of the patient. And what we could then do is uh, we bring the patient to theater. Um, if we want to do a necrosectomy, we'd upsize this drain to a 30 French sheet, which is sort of a thick as your, as your thumb. And, um, you can see in this picture on the right here, there is a very small, which is in this case a nephroscope or a, a nephroscope. We can go into that sh uh, sheet, and with the second instrument, uh, which is a little grasper, we can take necrosis out. Yeah. So the the transgastric that is the endoscopic route. I'll talk about that. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. So I'll show you a little video of the endoscopic of the um, percutaneous uh, necrosectomy first. Um, so basically the blue bit is the, that 30 French drain, and this is what pancreatic necrosis looks like. Um, it's pretty gruesome. Um, it always, to me, looks a bit like when you're um, unplugging the shower drain. Um, so we go in with an instrument. So this is the scope looking in any instrument just, and this can, depending on how big the, the collection is, can be an operation either an hour or it could be four hours, depending on, on how easy or difficult it is. And one of the main things why you have to do a surgeon is just to make sure that we, we can gently do what the surgeon is doing here now, is gently sort of teasing the tissue out, but you don't want to tear the tissue out because there's still um, um, vital tissue around it. And if it's stuck to a blood vessel, you cause some bleeding. It's going to be very difficult to stop that once you are, when you're doing such a keyhole, uh, keyhole approach. So this is that men, this is the minimal invasive necrosectomy as I showed you. So basically, this patient's got this 30 French sheet in the flank, and, and this is pancreatic necrosis, which has been pulled out. And then afterwards, it should look like this. So this is uh, the, the completion picture, and this is basically how the necrotic collection, the, the, the necro necrotic cavity uh, looks from the inside. So this is that 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 wall which sits around the uh, 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 collection. And this is a very nicely, clearly done uh, necrosectomy with hardly any necrosis left. And then you often, you leave a drain here because these patients will still leak uh, pancreatic fluid and that needs to be drained out via, via, via a big drain. Yeah, this is a percutaneous route, yeah. 
and then um, the endoscopic route. And let me just go and close. Oh, sorry. So um, it's going to go back. So then the, the endoscopic drainage, which is transgastric uh, most 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 times, uh, is where they go in with an endoscope, an ultrasound, uh, an endoscopic ultrasound, find the collection, and either put pictal drains in, as in this one, or they can do a what we call a hot axis drain, and that hot axis is actually a bit better when you want to do a necrosectomy. You need a hot axis to get access. And this is how it looks like on endoscopy. This is the hot axis sitting in the stomach uh, wall. Um, and obviously the other side it sits in the collection and and then basically the procedure looks pretty similar to the uh, procedure i showed you on the other one which is a percutaneous one where you see this necrosis which you can pull out so um that's so necrosectomy is a good way for patients who got infected necrosis don't get better a necrosectomy can get them can them better pancreatic pseudocyst so pseudocyst is just a fluid collection that's also sort of uh, walled off um, but this can't be necrosis because if there's necrosis in there, it's basically not called a pseudocyst. This can happen weeks or months after the patients with, uh, with pancreatitis. And again, the treatment would be, you can see the stomach here. If patients have symptoms of this, you, if, if they don't have symptoms, you don't need to treat it. But if patients have symptoms, you could uh, drain this with a, um, again, the whole axis via the stomach endoscopically. And sometimes the pseudocyst is because people have a pancreatic duct disruption uh, and then it won't always dry up with just an endoscopic uh, uh, drainage via the stomach, you might also need to put a pancreatic stent in them to make the, 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 the flow of least resistance into the duodenum. So again, EOS, um, and uh, well, you could also do a surgical cyst gastrostomy, but, but these days we mostly do an endoscopic approach for that. So aneurysm, all this pancreatic juice could eat away, erode into blood vessels, and, and then this is what you can see. This is a big uh, pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery. Um, which is best dealt with and this, uh, uh, via uh, interventional radiology. Uh, and this needs to be coiled or, or uh, they have to be caused in the splenic artery. You can, you can coil the splenic artery because the spleen gets blood supply from the short gastrics as well. So if this bleeding won't stop, otherwise you might want to coil the entire splenic artery without having to take the spleen. Um, portal vein thrombosis and a complication of pancreatitis. Um, you also have to sort of see what's the risk benefit of anticoagulation. Uh, obviously, you want to stop the thrombus from growing, but you don't want to have bleeding of pseudoaneurysm. We mostly don't treat uh, um, we don't treat portal vein thrombosis in um, in uh, pancreatitis because of the bleeding risk. And this study by Gonzalez um, have has sort of said also there's no real significant difference in complications or recanalization rate in patients that don't or do get uh, get uh, uh, anticoagulated. Are there any questions so far about all these drainage in the ranges? I went through it quite quickly, maybe, but uh, anybody um, want to speak up or shall I just crack on? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so before I go to um, chronic pancreatitis, so basically, um, most of the acute pancreatitis is luckily mild. Um, patients that get necrosis. Are often the patients who do uh, a, a sort of extensive necrosis. Even patients with with mild pancreatitis can get a little bit of necrosis. But um, yeah, well, I, I can go back to the hot axis because I think let's do that first because otherwise, um, um, let's go. So basically, oh, so. Um, let me go over to CT scan. So if you look at this picture here, so this is the necrotic collection. The stomach sits there, and there's basically two routes into any collection. You can either go percutaneously um, if there's a if there's a window, because equally there could be a loop of bowel sitting here, and then you can pop a drain in, and then you can drain the pancreatic collection that way. Once there's a drain in, that will guide your way in surgically, either via a um, minimal vasonecrostectomy, which I did with the scope, but you could equally... Um, if a patient had, you could just equally cut down on the drain with 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 a four or five centimeter or five to ten centimeter sort of like little incision and get a big grasp which you would use and open. We often use as a rampy. That's the same sort of grasp where we use to put a little sponge on when we when we prep the patients. So if you've got a large cut in the in the in the flank, you can also equally pull the necrosis out. That the whole axis route in is via the endoscopic route. So if you've got 
you've got the stomach here and just pop a gastroscope in or an endoscopic ultrasound, you can see where the um, the best way into that collection is endos uh, endoscopically. And you just um, make a hole into the into the, the pancreatic necrosis. And then you go here and then you can either deploy some of these uh, what we call pigtail stands, uh, which is a sort of a double tailed stand and it was a little curly thing, which is why it's called a pigtail. And, and in some patients, that's enough. Then you know that at least the, the pressure is off the collection and it drains into the into the stomach. But but better is, and we we, we do that more and more, is putting this well, this is the whole access stand. You can see so that this this will sort of sit in the wall, and this is where the stomach wall will be, and this is where the pancreatic wall of necrotic wall will be, and this sort of is a little tunnel between here the pancreatic necrosis and here the stomach, and then the pancreatic necrosis and the larger chunks of necrotic tissue can sort of drain into the stomach and then it will just drain out via the gut and that's a good route um, oh um so yeah um is that more clear now that sort of the hot axis or not okay um I don't understand Dominic's question. In all fairness, um, I hear I heard a consultant talk about CRP threshold to suggest necrosis rather than AP alone. I, you know, CRP is interesting. I mean, I think if patients got a very high CRP, that clearly means there's something wrong. But it doesn't per se. Um, well, necrosis is something you see on the scan. So if there's something that doesn't enhance, then there's necrotic tissue. So that's uh, it's a it's a CT diagnosis in my opinion. Uh, but clearly, P patients with a very high CRP have a higher chance of developing uh, a necrosis. So, um, so yeah, if you if you've got very advanced and severe disease, your CRP will be higher. Hence, there will be a, li a higher likelihood of of necrosis. But but I wouldn't I wouldn't there on i wouldn't go or buy crp alone i it, me as a hb surgeon i need to see the necrosis on the scan otherwise the patient hasn't got necrosis in my opinion um so chronic pancreatitis um basically it's a sort of when uh, um there's a sort of continuing inflammatory process with uh, loss of um, with loss of uh, pancreatic tissue and pancreas and then the formation of pancreatic fibro fibrosis so the the, the 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 gland gets really firm and hard and and the healthy pancreatic tissue basically gets replaced by non-functioning fibrotic scar tissue the incidence of this again it's, it's about two to 25 per hundred thousand so a bit less than acute pancreatitis and it's very strongly related to alcohol uh, uh, use. So I think uh, up to 70, it depends again which, which, which paper you read, but up to 70% of patients who've got chronic pancreatitis have chronic pancreatitis due to um, alcohol-related uh, uh, pancreatitis. And there's a higher um, incidence in male than female. Okay, so get a question about the management flow. So the, basically the management flow chart, it's for any patient with pancreatitis. So you, every patient with pancreatitis who comes in with acute pancreatitis, um, you go through the initial management phase where in the first sort of 72 hours, it's just sort of symptom control, make sure that they're well perfused with fluids, make sure to get, you know, uh, oral uh, uh, um, uh, uh, feeding. You know, you want people to eat and drink um, if that's possible. Um, and um, make sure that they are, you know, that they don't go into multi-organ failure, that all sort of the complications that can arise in severe pancreatitis are dealt with. Um, and then after uh, uh, after the sort of the first 48 to 72 hours, you will know if B patients become severe or, or, or remain mild. And if they remain mild, then obviously they can be discharged quite quickly. And then it, depending on the etiology, you know, if they get a, if they got gallstones, then you would want to do that early gallbladder removal. 
uh, if they got um, if they're alcoholics, you want to start talking to them about stopping to stop drinking. And if they got any other uh, uh, um, sort of uh, etiology, then you want to address that. So the flow chart, you only go further down the flow chart if patients remain unwell and become more unwell, because then you hit the next point of necrotic pancreatitis, effective necrosis. So so yeah, it's it's basically uh, the flow chart what I, which has shown. Uh, it evolves that way when people get more severely uh, well and get necros necrotic pancreatitis. Um, how long after? Yeah, and then doing a lab coli after severe necrotizing pancreatitis, that, that, that's anyone's guess, really. Um, it is basically, um, so you don't want to do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and somebody's still not great. So you need to, need to wait till patients are clinically well enough to do a, a procedure. And some patients never get the procedure. And some patients can take months, depends really. I mean, patients with really severe pancreatitis can be in hospital for more than a year. So it really depends how they recover from that uh, 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 when you do the laparoscopic cholecystectomy in those patients. So that, that's clinical judgment. There is no, there's no real guide for that at the moment. Good. So going on with the chronic pancreatitis. So again, cause of chronic pancreatitis are... Um, Um, alcohol uh, obstruction of the pancreatic duct. And that's, so when people get fibrotic uh, pancreatitis, fibrosis of the pancreas, they can deform stones within the pancreatic duct and not only gallstones, but they are sort of like chunks of, 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 of calcified tissue that can obstruct the duct. Um, I've got a picture of that later. Uh, tumor could obstruct the duct. Uh, pseudocysts could obstruct the duct. Um, Cystic fibrosis can be a cause of chronic pancreatitis and all kinds of autoimmune diseases can be a cause of pancreatitis. Um, so, um, symptoms of chronic pancreatitis, the main symptom is pain. These patients have a lot of pain and they're very difficult to treat. And they're often on uh, high doses of pain medication and they, they have to see chronic, they have to see um, uh, pain specialists and these kind of things. Loss of appetite uh, and weight loss. And this is all sort of, again, related to the pain. So people have pain, they don't want to eat because that just makes the pain worse. Then obviously they lose weight and it's sort of a vicious circle. Um, sort of more severe symptoms are jaundice if they also have sort of bile duct obstruction. Uh, and again, that could be sort of compression of a, of a big pancreatic cyst. And obviously your exocrine and your endocrine insufficiency. Uh, this is some images of pancreatitis because now you can go okay, again we'll go back you're going to see this is an enhanced scan this is this is a blood vessel here this is the aorta but these wide specs they basically look as wide as the bone does and these are uh, are a sort of pancreatic stones you can also see here that there's this is pancreat this is pancreas but this this dark bit here this is a dilated duct and because of these stones they sit in the pancreatic duct and the duct that sits sort of uh, um, um, upstream from the the stones they that they, they dilate. But it might be the gallbladder actually with some stones in there as well. Um, so, um, and again, here you can see obstructing stones with upstream duct, duct dilatation and a very atrophic pancreas, uh, which, which sits there. And this is a pancreas with sort of calcifications throughout pancreatic pseudocysts that they had in the tail, oh, had at the tail. Um, the treatment options, non-invasive, people need to stop drinking. Obviously, smoking doesn't help. People who continue to smoke have more pain. There are studies to prove that. And diet, a piece of a dietitian, sometimes change the diet might help pain medication. Um, PERT is uh, pancreatic uh, enzyme replacement therapy. So a lot of people have very lo uh, uh, low uh, production of enzymes. They will get abdominal pain. They will get uh, diarrhea. And so you have to give them, we call it Creon. It's basically just a tablet that contains enzymes and they need to take that with every meal and every snack. So some people are on very high doses of this pancreas replacement, pancreas enzyme replacement therapy, just to make sure that at least their bowel motions are sort of relatively normal. And you don't get like distension and pain and diarrhea and these kind of things because of, of, of uh, pancreas insufficiency. So in invasive treatment options, you could do an ERCP. Um, you could put drain, drain the uh, pancreatic duct, as you saw there. If you are a very great at your CPS and you manage to pop a stand past this, uh, this, 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 this formation of rocks there, then you might drain the pancreas a bit and improve the symptoms. It's very difficult, however, to get there. Uh, 
um, and EOS, you know, endoscopic ultrasound. So again, get an uh, endoscopy draining of pancreatic cysts. You can do a celiac plexus block, basically it's just injecting anesthetic in the celiac plexus just behind the pancreas to give uh, some pain relief. This is often not a, um, uh, a long lasting uh, uh, effect and, and, and it's only 50% uh, uh, successful and it only lasts for a few months. Lithotripsy, you could try sort of uh, with 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 uh, 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 sonic waves, try to crumble the stones and hopefully uh, relieve the symptoms. And then a surgical drainage, you can do a uh, just drainage of a pancreatic cyst, for instance, or a cyst gastrostomy surgically. And there's different ways of doing pancreatic or uh, uh bypassing or draining the duct. And I'll, I've got a few pictures of that. Uh, you could even do a Whipple, um, um, which is removing the head of the pancreas, the duodenum, the distal common bile duct, the gallbladder, and then cobbling it all together. I've got a picture of that later as well. That's a bit, that's a, the procedure is a very high morbidity rate. So you, you, don't, you don't really want to do that, especially not as someone who's got a lot of scar tissue in the pancreas already, because that's going to make it a dreadful operation. And a total pancreatectomy, you could take out the entire pancreas. Again, it's a dreadful operation because it's going to be difficult. Uh, with high morbidity um, and uh, patients will then become completely uh, insufficient for uh, anything in the pancreas. They get a very difficult to manage diabetes. So these are surgical procedures are things you want to stay away from really. And these are the four sort of surgical procedures you have. This is uh, what we call a, um, so in a Whipple, that's the one below here. That's I think the most, most common pancreas surgical procedure done, but it's mostly done for cancer. This one in the picture here is also done for cancer. Basically, you remove all the things that are sort of purple in here, where you remove the head of the pancreas, you move the duodenum, and then this, this is this first loop of jejunum. You cobble it all back together by doing an anastomosis there, but the leakage of this anastomosis is very high, and then this pancreatic juice can cause all the same problems pancreatitis causes. This is the, the, the joint with the, with the bile duct, and this is the joint with the stomach. You could also do a pancreatic head sparing procedure, which is called a Baker procedure. Again, this is, I, I've never seen it. And I don't think a lot of people still do it because there's a high risk of complications. Basically you've got two pancreatic joints and, and it can all leak and become very, very nasty. Um, this is uh, ooh, this is the uh, pusto where you have a dilated duct and you do a pancreatic uh, jejunostomy on the duct. The only good thing about operating in patients like doing a pusto or a fray for that matter is that the pancreas is really firm and has less chance of leaking than when you would do it for cancer in a soft pancreas. The difference between a pusto and a fray is that in a fray, you um, dig out the head of the pancreas and get rid of all those stones you saw in the earlier pictures. And so patients who have got a lot of stones in the head of the pancreas, you would do a fray um, and then do, do, do the same reconstruction. So this is a, a loop of jejunum, which you then suture onto the, uh, onto the pancreas. And the puster you can do for patients who don't really have a lot of head disease, but just a dilated duct. Um, so basically, um, severe acute pancreatitis is an affliction with a high morbidity, a high mortality and morbidity. Um, basically, initial treatment is symptom control and and organ support, um, and you don't want to do any interventions until at least week four or five, if if you can help it. Um, and management of complications and ongoing pancreatitis is it, it's not just a surgical management it's just it, you need it's a multidisciplinary team and and many different people are involved so um some centers have the endoscopic uh, the gastroenterologists do the endoscopic uh, necrosectomies or the radiologists that worked in a center where the radiologists would do them and the surgeons so uh, but dietitians need to be involved you need to involve intensive care doctors you need to involve anesthetists um, so basically, it's a very, uh, a very complex uh, disease to manage, especially when it comes to the more severe the chronic pancreatitis patients. And I think surgical intervention in chronic pancreatitis should only be done in a very select group of patients because the complications of the surgery are really high, and 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 actually the sort of the outcome of them are not always great. Um, there's now a study running again, the one of the pancreatitis work group studies, and we're in Bristol are taking part in that study where we're going to see. Um, uh, what what the outcome for patients we operate on, but but even including patients for such a study is very difficult because there's so few patients that we uh, that we operate on. I think the main thing to realize is that treatment of pancreatitis, if it's acute or chronic, it's it's a marathon on the sprint. So you have to be very very patient. You have to be 
you have to keep your hands on your back for a very long time and acute pancreatitis really resists the urge of going in and doing an, a drainage of some sort because you often will only make things worse and you really have to give the body the time to form that uh, uh, wall around the necrotic collection before you intervene you really need to because you can't intervene when there's no wall because you, you can see that the drain won't go in or that little pot access stand won't sit and, and if the fluid collection is not infected yet you're clearly infected as soon as you stick a needle in So yeah, that's um, Bristol Harbor for you guys. Um, and um, let's go for the um, few. So I think the question I didn't answer is percutaneous transgastric. Um, so you can basically, I don't know what I'm asking, but there is, I mean, so so what happens often now in, in centers that have a very endoscopic approach, they will always go for the endoscopic route first because you won't have an external fistula. You will always have a fistula, but you won't have an external fistula. And, and, and the problem with an external fistula, people can have drains for months sticking out of their uh, abdominal wall, and which is obviously a, a nuisance for patients. So, um, um, but, but sometimes endoscopic drainage isn't enough, and then you have to put a percutaneous drain as well. So you can combine the two. Um, there are also centers that don't really have a good um, endoscopic surface, so they always go for percutaneous. And sometimes um, one route is not possible, but 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 there are combinations possible. So to answer the second question, um, yeah, so often yes. So if people have alcoholic and gallstone combined, you often take away the gall gall because you want to make sure that there's not a second insult on the on the on the pancreas on the on the uh, uh, on the pancreas. I think if I'm not remember if I'm remembering correctly, I think there's also a study running somewhere into this. But I, I at the moment I would often offer people a, 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 a lab coli as well. Um, so Alina asked, could you please explain the slide about port of thrombosis again and Um, I can go back to the one. Oh, oh my goodness, I'm wrong. Basically, due to the inflam in due to the inflammatory reaction, there is sort of thrombotic um, the, the, thrombosis is induced in the vessels around the, and especially the veins around the pancreas, and this can involve the splenic vein, the portal vein, or the superior mesenteric vein. Um, the splenic vein is not a big issue if that thrombosis, because first of all, there are the short gastrics through which the spleen drains. Even the portal vein, when it's often doesn't really give an issue when it's thrombosed and there's quite quick collateral, uh, collateral forming, collateral vein forming towards the liver. Uh, patients don't really get in well with that. Um, only The only one we would consider maybe doing, putting, giving anticoagulation would be, be patients with quite a severe uh, uh, superior mesenteric vein thrombosis. The problem with it is if patients have uh, superior mesenteric vein thrombosis, you can get outflow obstruction of the of the gut and you can get um, ischemia of the gut due to outflow obstruction. And obviously when you get that gut, then people are in big trouble. So that people have, so, but then still, I would still would want to see, um, I would want to see um, uh, evidence for that on the scan, even in patients with superior mesenteric vein thrombosis before I start really aggressively um, uh, anticoagulating them. The problem is with anticoagulating that there, bleeding is a well-known and, 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 and dangerous risk in pancreatitis. So if you give patients uh, ther uh, therapeutic anticoagulation and they bleed, they bleed severely and that could kill them. So you have to be careful. And, and, and as the often the, the complications that arise from the portal vein thrombosis are not that high, the risk of bleeding are higher, so you choose for the the thing that kills. Uh, you know, you you have to choose what is more dangerous for the patient. It, I mean, it is between a rock and a hard place, clearly. But um, yeah, does that answer your question, uh, Alina? Um, so, um, Artan, 
is where is the borderline between surgery and interventional gastroenterology removed? So I think there is no, so yeah. So if you got common bowel duct stones, um, you'd often do an ERCP clearly, but um, there are also centers and surgeons, um, myself included, um, who can do common bowel duct expirations due to, due, uh, at the time of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So if you've got a few stones in an object, you could also take them out during a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So again, um, so basically in the setting of pancreatitis, it's so if you've got common bowel duct stones um, without cholangitis in a predicted severe uh, pancreatitis, you do not do an ERCP. Unless you've got cholangitis, then you do an ERCP to relieve the cholangitis. Um, the gallstone is removed, the gallbladder is removed in a mild pancreatitis, hopefully on the index emission or sort of within two weeks, you know, it's logistical reasons obviously uh, make it a bit more difficult. Um, but um, yeah, so it depends a bit. I mean, and if, if patients are non-symptomatic with a small common bowel duct stone and you're going to do the gallbladder within that week and you know how to do a uh, common bowel duct expiration laparoscopically, there's no reason why you should it. But again, it, it's operate dependent. If you know how to do a common bowel duct expiration and you feel comfortable, then there's no reason not to. But again, it should be only in the mild pancreatitis. Um, all right. That was Arton, I think. Was that okay, Arton or not? Did that answer your question? All right. So any more questions then, or is that it? I'm gonna make a bit more. Uh... So if anybody, most of you will already be members of Turks, otherwise you won't be here today. Uh, follow us on Twitter. And then again, I mean, this is gonna be a bit more, um, I mean, obviously this is gonna be, um, not that much focused on medical students, but still very interesting presentation, I think, um, about common bowel duct injury. So, which happens after gallbladder removal. Um, and especially Shiva will have a very nice talk because it's gonna be about sort of, and I think that's um, interesting for anybody, even if you don't really master the, uh, the subject, it's just about how to, uh, how to help other people. And I think, you know, especially in modern day surgery, it's very important to, it's it's not a uh, it's not a uh, it's a team sport basically. So you need to help each other, and and um, if you make a big complication, that can be very uh, mentally very challenging as well. So there's going to be very interesting talk about uh, about that. So if you are at uh, in the opportunity to dial in on the second of October, then uh, by all means, that's it. I think. Thank you so much. That was great, and thank you everyone for great questions. I think that was really engaging. And, yeah it was good i enjoyed it uh, it was really good and if anyone has any um questions feel free to get in touch with us on twitter or you can always email us um but yeah thank you so much for attending and thank you for a great lecture hopefully the lecture is going to be put onto youtube soon um i'm in the process of putting all the tugs teaching sessions onto youtube so that will be a resource which will be available to everyone in the future um so Thank you everyone for attending and hope everyone has a good evening. So I'm gonna um, close the event now. So thank you very much. Thank you, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.